Hi, I'm Jared Pottiger, Education Services Manager for Deskcase, and today we're going to talk about how to double the service life of your gearboxes using precision lubrication. So what is precision lubrication? Well, what precision lubrication is not is just using better lubricants, and this is a common mistake that people make. But if you take the average machine and you replace the average oil in it with the best oil you can get, it's usually not going to lead to better lubrication or better anything else. There's a lot of other things we have to do right first. Lubricant quality is important. I'm not saying that it isn't. But in order to get value from high performance lubricants, we've got to do some other things first. Another thing that isn't precision lubrication and is not good lubrication is just doing more of it. Usually, or oftentimes, at least when we do unnecessary lubrication activities, we're just wasting time and wasting resources. But in other cases, you can actually cause harm by lubricating something too frequently. So optimizing the frequency with which we apply lubricants is a very important part of this process. Really, to be successful in lubricating our machines or lubricating our plant, we really have to take a holistic approach. We have to look at everything, and that really starts with selecting the correct, not the best, but the correct type of lubricant for each application. It also means that we educate all of the individuals that are involved in lubricating machinery. Educate them not only so they understand what to do, but why it's important. You know, understanding the implications of how we change oil or how we take an oil sample or apply grease is just as important as how to do it correctly because when people understand the reason behind it, when they understand what the end goal is that they're trying to accomplish, they're probably going to be more successful and they're going to be more enthusiastic about executing the, the program as designed. Contamination control is probably the single biggest factor or the single most important factor in precision lubrication because this is where we really change the service life of lubricated components not just gearboxes but all of them we have to do certain things correct in order to get that benefit such as having the correct type of lubricant and making sure that it's suitable for use but when it comes to extending the life of components it's about preventing wear and most wear is caused by contamination we also need to optimize RPM so that our oil is in suitable shape for use. We need to make sure we're changing oil at the right frequency. We need to make sure that we're inspecting oil level and oil appearance at the right frequency. We also need to look at storage and handling. This is really the foundation for good contamination control is how we store and dispense and apply lubricants. And then finally, we need to have a good oil analysis program so that we can verify that what we're doing with lubrication is working. We can verify that we do in fact have the right oil in each machine, that it is suitable for use, and that it's suitably free of contaminants. And oil analysis is a perfect tool to create metrics to identify how effectively we're lubricating our plant. Now as a bonus, it's always important to point out that doing things the right way or the better way is oftentimes a lot easier than doing it the old-fashioned way or the way that most people do it. When it comes to gearboxes, a good example would be doing an oil change. The best way, the most effective way to get clean oil into a gearbox when we do an oil change is to use a filter cart to add the new oil. We can also use the filter cart to evacuate the used oil as well. Now the reason for doing this is so we get clean oil into the machine but as an added bonus it's a much more efficient task it takes about half the time to do the oil change and there's also other benefits as well it's safer it's more environmentally sound the list goes on and on but those are all just side benefits to the real goal of getting clean oil into the machine so to be successful lubricating gearboxes to be successful implementing precision lubrication one thing that everybody needs to understand is why it's important to understand why gears fail or why gearboxes fail or why gears wear out we need to understand the root causes of machine wear and we're going to look at that in just a few moments 
Some of the things that we're going to need to do correctly, or all of the things we're going to need to do correctly, are these. We need to select the correct lubricant for each application. This is true for all lubricated machinery. Gearboxes are no different. We're going to need to optimize our lubrication PMs. We're going to need to make sure we're changing the oil at the right frequency, and we're going to need to make sure that we set up inspection procedures so that we verify the correct oil level, verify that breathers and filters are functioning correctly, and take oil samples when we need to. We're also going to need to develop and utilize a strategy for controlling contamination in gearboxes. There are several different ways we can do this and we'll discuss the most common ones today. And finally, we need to identify the most appropriate configuration for our gearboxes. And a lot of times this means some minor modifications such as changing the type of sight glass that we use or adding a sample port so that we can take a good oil sample or upgrading the breather. And there's a number of other modifications we could make as well. But usually, if we're moving from an average lubrication program to a world-class lubrication program, we're going to have to make some of these minor modifications to our equipment. So back to our first point, which was why gearboxes fail in the first place. And this is not just for gearboxes. This is really true for any lubricated machine. There was a study done at MIT years ago where they studied what they called loss of usefulness, or you could think of this as lost service life or whatever. But what causes machines to become useless? And what they found was that 15% of the time, machines become obsolete. They get replaced with a newer, better, more efficient machine. Another 15% of the time, we break machines, either due to you know, improper maintenance, improper operation, or whatever, a number of different reasons, but accidents lead to machine failures. But the vast majority of the time, 70% of the time, 70% of the time, lost machine usefulness or lost machine component life comes from surface degradation. Well, another way to say surface degradation is wear. So what this is really telling us is what we already know, and that is that most machine life is due to wear. Things wear out. They're supposed to. The job of lubrication is to prevent wear. So in as much as we can control the quality of lubrication for a lubricated machine, we can control the rate of wear. And if we can control the rate of wear, we can extend the life of that machine. So let's look a little further. If we take that surface degradation or wear and break that down, we find that 50% of lost machine life is due to mechanical wear and 20% is due to corrosive wear. Both of these are largely lubricated related issues. Those are two of the primary functions of a lubricant is to prevent wear and to prevent corrosion. If we focus on mechanical wear, that being the biggest share, if we break that down and look at why it is that machines wear mechanically, we see that while there may be many different types of wear, most of it comes from just a few causes. This information comes from a study done by the Society of Tribologists and Lubrication Engineers. And in this study, they looked at more than 3,700 equipment failures, and in each case identified the predominant type of wear. They found that 60, in 66% of cases, the predominant type of wear is abrasion. In 12% of cases, it was adhesion, 8% erosion, and 8% fatigue. Now, adhesion is something that happens in gears when we don't have enough film strength. So this is usually a matter of using the wrong type of lubricant or the wrong viscosity grade of lubricant. So that's something that we can absolutely address and it's easy to address. But if you look at the other big three, especially the first one, which accounts for most, abrasion, erosion, and fatigue, what we find is, is that the predominant root cause, the most common root cause by far, is particle contamination. And it's made even worse when we have moisture contamination in the oil. As moisture causes, causes the oil film to become thinner, things get closer together, so particles can actually do more damage. So the point is, 
most wear is caused by lubricant contamination. If we can prevent lubricant contamination, we can prevent most wear. And wear is the cause of most lost machine life. So if we can control contamination, we can control wear rates, we can extend the life of machinery. Gearboxes can be somewhat challenging from a lubricant selection or lubricant formulation standpoint because unlike some components, gearboxes have several different types of lubricated components. They have bearings and they have gears. They have gears that are moving fast and they have gears that are moving slow. So we have to use a lubricant that will address all of these conditions. In terms of lubricating film types, a gear set or a gear box could experience all types of lubricating films. In the sliding contacts between the gears, we can have boundary lubrication, we could have mixed film lubrication, or hydrodynamic, all of which affect lubricant selection. Which of these we have is really based on three different things. It's based on the speed with which the surfaces pass each other, it's based on the load that's applied between those surfaces, and the viscosity of the oil. Of course, the viscosity being the one that we actually control. In addition to that, we have rolling contacts in a gearbox. We have element bearings, typically, and we also have rolling contacts between the gears themselves on the pitch line of the gear where one gear rolls over the other. We have a completely different type of lubrication situation. So in this case, we have to use a lubricant that will address all of these concerns. So it can be somewhat challenging, but lubricant selection for the end user is still relatively simple. There are other challenges. Another source of challenges for oil lubricated gearboxes is the type of lubricant delivery system that they use. Most gearboxes utilize a bath or splash lubrication system. And in a bath lubrication system, good lubrication can be challenging. Now, for one thing, the oil level is extremely critical. The correct oil level for a bath lubricated gearbox is to completely submerge the lowest tooth. And most gearboxes don't hold a lot of oil. There's confined space there. There's a lim limited space. So the difference between the perfect oil level and an insufficiently low oil level could be less than half an inch in many cases. So that's something that we need to be aware of. There's also issues with dry starts. If you have gearboxes that are running part of the time and they're down part of the time, when the oil drains down, those items that are above the oil level are exposed to humidity potentially, uh, and you know, which causes corrosion. And then when we start them up, there's a risk of inadequate lubrication just because it takes a while to actually distribute the oil. It's also very difficult to control the, the temperature in a bath lubricated gearbox. In fact, it's, it's practically impossible in many cases. Rather than control the temperature of the gearbox, we simply have to react to the operating temperature and take steps in terms of lubricant selection and other things to deal with the temperature. It's also very challenging to control contamination. You know, while a gearbox may not be as sensitive to contamination as, say, a hydraulic system, a hydraulic system usually has filters, so even if we're not super careful with how we handle oil and how we manage that system, we still have contamination control. But with the gearbox, for most of them where we don't have onboard filtration, the care with which we handle lubricants and apply them is super critical because in most gearboxes, the oil is only ever going to be as clean as it is when we put it in. As I mentioned before, there's a risk of inadequate lubrication due to the temperature effects on viscosity and inadequate distribution of the oil without, throughout the system. And then there's also the effects of wear debris. Because there's no onboard filtration, the wear that is generated in a gearbox becomes not only the symptom of wear, but also becomes the cause of wear as well. It can actually lead to particle-induced wear as particles become work hardened in the system. So for lubricant selection, in all cases, the most important part of our selection is viscosity. There are different types of gear oils. We can have EP gear oils, RNO gear oils, anti-wear and compounded gear oils. 
but the most important thing right off the bat is to get the correct viscosity. Now the right way to do this in the vast majority of cases is simply to consult the OEM manual and look at the lubricant specification that's provided. Now we may need to interpret that specification. We may need to translate that into something that's more meaningful to us. For example, the OEM may describe one particular lubricant or may offer one particular qualified lubricant as being suitable for that application. We may not use that brand of lubricant, so we need to be able to interpret that. And if we can't, we can always call our lubricant supplier to help make that translation. But there are some cases where you may actually have to create the specification yourself. Maybe you've got a really old gearbox or something that was custom made or the maker is no longer in business or the manual is lost, etc. So there could be reason for this. In the case of gearboxes, now this may look or sound a little complicated, but it's really not that bad. We need to know two things. We need to know the pitch line velocity of the final stage driven gear and we need to know the likely operating temperature of the gearbox. So like I said, the calculating the pitch line velocity of the gear may sound a little challenging, but all we really need to do is estimate the diameter of the final stage gear, multiply that times pi, multiply it by the output speed, or the rotational speed of that gear, that's going to give us the pitch line velocity, or a close approximation. We don't know, we don't have to know exactly what the pitch diameter of the gear is. Once we have that information, we convert it to meters per second and we go to our AGMA chart and we line that up with the correct line. Let's just say, for example, that we have calculated our pitch line velocity to be in the range of 10 meters per second. And then we are going to estimate our likely operating temperature to be 65 degrees C or close to it and that gives us a recommended viscosity grade of ISO 220. Now I should keep in mind that for most reducers that aren't worm gears most non-worm gear reducers can use 220. Some of them use 320 if it's a little slower maybe some use 150 if it's a little bit faster but most of them work on 220. Worm gears, those are treated differently. In fact, as you notice in the header of the chart here, we typically look at gears as being worm gears or non-worm gears. So spur gears, helical gears, bevel gears, herringbone gears, they're all treated in one group. And then worm gears get their own treatment. So the second part of any good lubricant specification is the type of additive system. So 220 oil is not a good specification. We need to identify what type of oil what type of 220 we should use. Now some gearbox manufacturers leave this up to you. They say if you have certain conditions use an EP oil otherwise use RNO. Sometimes they specify one in particular but what I would suggest is that in all cases when we're talking about non-worm gears that if you don't know you should choose EP. There's, there's not a lot of downside to using EP lubricants in most cases. I'll point out what the exceptions are. But when in doubt, use EP because it's very difficult, practically impossible, to calculate or determine when you have boundary conditions and when you have hydrodynamic conditions. So EP lubricants are typically preferred for all non-worm gears. Now there are a few times when we might not want to do that. For example, uh, if we have a worm gear or any other application where we have uh, yellow metals and brass or bronze gears uh, in the system, that is not a good application for sulfur phosphorus EP additives as they can be excessively corrosive with those surfaces. There are some applications that have internal backstops. EP additives can cause problems with internal backstops, cause them to fail. So again, we should always consult the OEM literature. There should be a very clear indication in this case of whether or not you could use EP as if this is a safety issue. And then possibly if we have applications that undergo a lot of shock loading or if it's in a very cold environment where some EP additives may not work well, uh, we might want to consider solid or non-chemically active EP agents such as borates, or molly or a number of different proprietary 
uh, solid EP additives that are out there on the market. Again, worm gears get their own treatment, so we have a different method for estimating viscosity requirements for worm gears, but it uses the same, the same methodology. So in this case, we need to estimate or calculate the pitch line velocity of the final driven gear. And if it is slow, if it's less than two and a quarter meters per second under normal temperatures, we're going to recommend a 680. And if it is above, it's, if it's a little bit faster worm gear, if it's above two and a quarter meters per second, we're going to use 460. 460 or 680 will work in most cases. Now again, for worm gears, we don't use sulfur phosphorus EP additives because we typically have a driven gear made of bronze or brass that could be subject to severe corrosion if we use a sulfur phosphorus EP. So we're typically going to use a compounded oil. Now compounding gives added lubricity to the oil which increases the film strength and sliding contacts. So it's very appropriate for a worm gear application. Sulfur phosphorus again could be corrosive to those surfaces. In severe conditions, a lot of people choose to use a polyglycol formulated worm gear oil. Polyglycol has better lubricity in most cases than mineral oil. So polyglycol oils, the oil itself can offer better film strength and sliding contacts and may be beneficial in worm gear applications. And then one other note is that a lot of times we have worm gears that use 680 and we have some that use 460 but they really could use either one so when we have a case like that we should see if we can consolidate see if we can eliminate one of those viscosity grades and consolidate our lubricants a lot of advantages to doing that now as I said before when it comes to really transforming and changing or improving the service life of a lubricated component, gearboxes, bearings, engines, anything. It's really all about controlling contamination. We must have the right type of oil. We must ensure the chemical integrity of the lubricating oil. But if we really want to change things, we need to focus on controlling contamination. And contamination control has a process. In practice, it can be challenging, but the process itself is quite simple. The first step in that process is to identify what clean is. How clean should the oil be? There's an answer for that for different types of machines and we'll get to that in a moment. The next thing we need to do is identify what we can do to achieve those targets. If we haven't put a lot of effort into it already, chances are we're going to need to change something in order to achieve that. So we identify what those things are then we implement those in a logical order, starting with the easy things first, moving to the more difficult or more expensive things. Then we need to be able to effectively measure the results of that. We need to be able to measure particle counts effectively. We need to be able to measure moisture concentration effectively and determine if we're actually achieving what we set out to do. So back to step one. Step one is to identify the target cleanliness level for gearboxes. If you ask five different people what your target cleanliness should be for a gearbox, you may get that many different answers, but this is one example of a good starting point. 1916-13 or 1917-14 is a pretty fair target cleanliness level for gearboxes. This would be a, a non-filtered bath lubricated gearbox where we don't have any onboard filtration. And then a target moisture limit of 300 parts per million. Now, again, if you haven't taken steps to, to do this, to control contamination, it's very unlikely that you're already hitting these numbers. So you're probably going to have to change something. But one of the things that is required to do that in a lot of cases is money or effort or both. You know, it's not as simple as just doing something a different way sometimes. We actually have to make an investment to hit those targets. So we need to be able to predict what that's going to mean for us in the end. What kind of improvement can we expect? And that's where we derive the name for this course today is how to double the life of gearboxes. And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do it by hitting those targets. 
Let's just consider that our gearboxes currently have a typical particle count for gearboxes of 23, 21, 18. That is not at all uncommon. That is probably an average particle count for the average gearbox and the average plant. So this chart that we're looking at shows us what type of change in component life we can expect by moving from one cleanliness level to another. So if we start out at 23, 21, 18, and we move to our target of 19, 16, 13, we can see what kind of change we can expect. So at 23, 21, 18, we have about 45 units of component life. At 19, 17, 14, or 19, 16, 13, we have about 90 or 95 units of component life. So 90 over 45 equals 2. So what we should expect by going from 23, 21, 18 to 19, 17, 14 in a gearbox is to double the life of that gearbox or cut the rate of failures in half or cut the maintenance costs in half. So there's a lot of ways we can do that, but we can utilize this as a basis to create a cost benefit analysis for investing in the things that we need to do to hit that target in the first place. We could also do the same thing for water. Water, this is kind of hard to put a fine point on it because water and particles commonly work together. Okay, what the water does is decreases the film thickness. And by decreasing the film thickness, it's the, basically the same thing as adding a lot more particle contamination. Because that's how the two things work together. Water causes the surfaces to get closer together. The particles themselves really do most of the damage. But just to kind of put into perspective how big this effect can be, if you look at the life of a bearing, an element bearing, with 100 parts per million of water in the oil, we get about 100 units of bearing life. By the time we get up to 1,000 parts per million, and let me say that 1,000 parts per million is not a lot of water. That's one-tenth of 1%. One it's really just enough water in the oil to cause the oil to look a little bit cloudy. By that point, we've already lost approximately 75% of bearing life. So this effect of water on film thickness, particularly in rolling contacts, is very profound. So just to kind of put a real world example to this, this is one example for gearing or for contamination control in gearing. In this case study comes from a large copper mine in Utah. And among other things that this plant did to improve lubrication uh, with their mobile equipment as well as stationary was to utilize portable filtration to filter things that don't otherwise have filtration. In this case, we're talking about the final drives on haul trucks. So prior to making any changes, they were getting 9,000 hours as a mean time between failure for final drives on the haul trucks. What they decided to do in an effort to improve that was to take a portable filter card and filter each of those final drives while the truck was in for service. Every 500 hours when they were doing an oil change, they would take the filter cart and rotate it from one final drive to the other and filter each one. The results of this were that their mean time between failure went from 9,000 hours to 13,000 hours. Now that's a heck of an improvement. Their average cost to rebuild went from 19,900 down to 175. And the thing that really matters here, the thing that really spells it out is that their operating cost went from $2.11 to $1.36 per hour. That's a 36% reduction in maintenance cost. And what this doesn't actually speak to is the increased availability of the asset. So at the same time we're reducing maintenance costs, we're also keeping that piece of equipment in the field longer, allowing it to make more money. You might also notice that their oil change interval went from 2,000 hours to 6,000 hours. This is a common result of controlling the condition of lubricants, is to cause the lubricant to last longer by removing things that cause it to oxidize, like wear metals. In the case of a final drive or a differential, this is a very large effect. To control contamination in gearboxes, we can take one of two approaches, or both. We can either exclude contamination, or we can focus on removing contamination, or both. In most cases, we want to pay closest attention to excluding contamination because this is the easier way 
it is the cheaper way to keep contaminants out of our oil. There are a lot of gearboxes where removing contamination just isn't practical because we don't have the time, we don't have the money, or for a number of other good reasons, we're just not going to do it. So we really need to pay attention on how we exclude contamination. Now the good news here, if there was any, is that most contamination in gearboxes comes from just two places. It comes from the new oil that we put in the machine and it comes from the air that the sump breathes. So those are two of the things that we definitely want to focus on correcting. We can filter our new oil. We can use good application methods to actually get that clean oil into the machine. We can upgrade breathers to address the issue of humid and dirty air that enters the sump. We can utilize non-invasive inspection techniques which basically means getting rid of dipsticks and replacing those with sight glasses and not dropping a tube into the sump you know, through the fill port to take an oil sample but rather installing a sample valve so that we can take a good sample. Now in some cases contamination exclusion is not going to be enough. You know, In some cases we're, need, we're going to need to actually focus on contamination removal as well. And most gearboxes don't actually have onboard filtration, but some do. And in those that do, we can look at upgrading those filters. If a gearbox has a circulating system and has a filter on it, we could maybe use a better one. Uh, if that doesn't work, we could look at adding a kidney loop filtration system. Oftentimes the easiest and definitely the most effective way to keep clean oil in a gearbox. If we can't justify a permanently installed kidney loop system, maybe we can use portable offline filtration like filter carts. Most people have these these days, but they still don't utilize them everywhere they could. In certain systems where it's justifiable, we can also look at water removal techniques such as vacuum dehydrators or centrifuges or coalescing filters. And in most cases, anywhere we can use a filter cart, we also have the ability to use water absorbing filters to remove water from the system as well, at least the free and emulsified water. So just keep in mind when formulating a strategy for controlling contamination that it is typically about 10 times more expensive to remove contamination than it is to prevent it. So that's always where we should look first. Now there are quite a few different ways again that we can do this, but we need to really pay attention to the two big ones which are new oil, new oil cleanliness, and the air that the sump breathes. We call that, as a topic, we call that headspace management. Managing the condition of the air that comes into contact with the oil. So that's one of the big ones. We can do this by a number of different methods. Desiccant breathers, dry air purge, nitrogen purge, expansion chambers, and others. Uh, we can utilize quality seals. And this is something that people have been doing more and more is getting away from ineffective cheap seals and moving towards mechanical seals. Uh, we can certainly filter our new oil, but it doesn't, again, it doesn't, just filtering new oil is not going to get us where we need to be. We also need to make sure that we use methods that allow us to get clean oil into the machine, not just that we have it clean at one point. We can also look at how we store gearboxes or store parts for gearboxes. and. Again, we need to focus on not just filtering the new oil, but the tools that we use to transfer it, the tools that we use to apply it. Those are going to be very important as well. The best way always, you know, assuming the gearbox is large enough, the best way to transfer oil is to use a filter cart fitted with quick connects so that we can actually pump clean oil into the machine without ever opening it in the first place. And to look more closely at this issue of headspace management, now, this is not only one of the two major sources for particle contamination, this is the number one source for moisture contamination in gearboxes. Most manufacturing facilities present humid environments. Oftentimes relative humidity is at 100%. So if in the evening it cools down at all, you can have condensation. If there's dew outside or dew on the floor, there can absolutely be dew inside the machines. So we need to do something to bring down that humidity when air enters the sump. And there's a simple solution for that. Desiccant breathers not only remove the particles 
that come in with the air, but they also pull the relative humidity down to about 25%, preventing condensation inside the sump. There are other ways we could do this as well. We could put positive pressure on the system with conditioned air or with nitrogen, assuming that the quality of the air or nitrogen is appropriate, meaning it's dry and clean. If we maintain positive pressure inside the system at all times, it's impossible for the humid, dirty air around the machine to get inside. There are other things such as expansion chambers and hybrid breathers that we can use as well, but we need to focus on the air that the sump breathes and the new oil that enters that we put into the sump. In this next slide, we see an example of doing just that, of controlling the condition of the oil that goes in. At this gearbox in a paper mill, whenever they change the oil, they use their gearbox to actually take the old oil out. This, this filter cart has bypass valves that allow you to isolate the filter so that when you're evacuating the old oil, you don't have to run it through your filters. So they isolate the filters, use the filter cart to pump the old oil out into a waste container, then they reconfigure, pump the new oil in through the filters so that there's clean oil going into the sump, and then once they've completed that, they take the suction line off of the new oil container, apply it to the drain port on the gearbox, and then circulate that oil inside the gearbox. This is an extremely effective method for getting clean oil in the machine, and the additional step of circulating that oil inside the gearbox will ensure that that oil is going to stay clean probably for the entire service life of that oil change. And if you look at the slide, if you look at the pictures, these are what we call patch tests. And this is where you take a filter patch and run a sample of oil through it and then look at it under a microscope. Now these pictures are not magnified. This is just pictures taken with a camera. If you look at the the patch in the upper right hand corner, you'll see that it is new oil. This was how much debris was in the new oil. The one directly to the right of it is from the used oil that was discarded. As you can see, the discarded used oil was cleaner than the new oil. And then in the lower left hand corner, we have a patch from the, the new oil after it was filtered for three hours with the filter cart. If you look at these magnified images, this is made very clear. This image shows the new oil before it was filtered at 100 times the magnification. Now, if you look at all of those little crystals, those are mostly silica, by the way, which are very, very hard and very damaging to machine surfaces. If you realize that the life of that gear set is directly tied to how much of that stuff is in the oil, it's not hard to understand or to believe that the absence of those you know, having oil that's this clean will cause that gearbox to last at least twice as long, if not longer. So this is an excellent method for not only introducing clean oil, but also correcting any contamination or eliminating any contamination that had gotten into the system via other methods. As I mentioned at the beginning, precision lubrication for gearboxes and especially contamination control oftentimes it's going to require some level of modification. These modifications are usually very simple. Usually it means we're going to need to address inspections, oil sampling, fluid transfers, and contamination control. So for to prevent contamination from entering the system, we have quick connect fitting. So we can either use a high quality top-up container or preferably our filtration unit with quick connect fitting so that we can apply new oil without even opening the sump. For the breather, we have a high quality desiccant breather that's going to prevent moisture and particles from entering the sump. For visual inspections to check the oil level and the visual appearance of the oil, we have a number of different high quality sight glasses that are available that we can remove the dipsticks, eliminate the need for dipsticks and level plugs altogether. That way we can easily and efficiently check the oil level and at the same time we can get a look at the oil which gives us some sense of that oil's condition. Now, there isn't a one-size-fits-all when it comes to, to equipment modifications, and gearboxes are no different, but you may find that you only need two or three or four different configurations. So a big part of engineering and implementing precision lubrication is to identify and define a preferred configuration. 
And like I said, what you normally find is that while you may have dozens of different styles of gearboxes, when it comes to modifying them, you probably only have two or three or four different types that actually require a different treatment in terms of modification. So this is just one example of a gearbox modification plan. Again, we have our quick neck fittings to utilize our, our lubricant transfer and decontamination equipment. We have a sight glass that allows us to visually inspect the oil level. We have a sample valve with pitot tube, and we have a high quality desiccant breather. There, are, Like I said, there are different configurations, but usually just a few will fit. For a concentric shaft gearbox, we may utilize something like this. We have composite fittings here that have, for the top port, we have a breather, we have a quick connect fitting, and a vacuum gauge that gives us an indication of the condition of the breather. And for the drain port, we have a quick connect fitting, a sight glass, and a sample valve. For a shaft mounted reducer like this one, that probably has two or sometimes even three ports on each side, well, we can apply all of these things to each port individually. We don't need to combine them. But once you go through the process of identifying which gearboxes need to be modified, again, you'll find that there's just a few different configurations, and it's easy to create a, conferred con a preferred configuration. So now that we've figured out how to control the condition of lubrication in our in-service gearboxes, we may also want to look at stored gearboxes. Gearboxes can last a long time. Sometimes spares can sit on the shelf for many years before we get around to using them. So we need to consider our lubrication practices for those components as well. The thing that we are most concerned with, of course, is corrosion. If a component sits on the shelf and it's not filled with oil and we get humid air inside, we're going to get corrosion. So there's several easy ways that we can deal with this. One of them is to completely fill the unit with oil. Even though we wouldn't run it that way, when it's sitting on the shelf, there's nothing wrong with that. So we can take the breather plug out, fill it all the way to the top with oil, and then replace that breather plug with a solid plug that will prevent oil from leaking. Now this works if we have oil tight seals but if we don't have oil tight seals it's just going to leak so in those cases a better option is to use what's called a vapor phase corrosion inhibitor which is an additive we can put in the oil that is going to coat all of the exposed metal in the headspace with a water displacing agent and prevent corrosion if you have an oil mist system in the area you could plug the oil mist system into the gearbox that's on the shelf and that would fill the head space with dry air and oil mist, which would work very well. You could also use instrument quality air, nitrogen, any clean dry uh, fluid that will keep positive pressure in the system will prevent humid air from entering the system and condensation. Uh, we may also want to think about the outside components of the gearbox as well. It's a good idea to protect the, the shafts that are exposed to make it easy, easier to install when the time comes so we can protect those with a preservative and possibly plastic wrap as well. We can also lubricate any exposed uh, lip seals with, with grease to prevent them from drying out. So there are a lot of different things that we need to consider when lubricating gearboxes, but we really can boil it down to just a few simple, simple techniques. We need to make sure that we have the correct oil in each machine, the right viscosity grade. We need to make sure that we have the correct type of gear oil for each application. And then we need to put together a good contamination control strategy. We need to identify how clean the oil should be, identify all of the steps we can take to achieve that, including filtering new oil, transferring oil in a clean way, and preventing airborne contamination from getting into the system. And then finally, monitoring it effectively so that we can see if we're actually being effective with those. If we do that, doubling the life of gearboxes is not that hard to do. We could even triple or quadruple the life of some gearboxes, depending upon the current state. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Jared Pottinger for Deskcase, and this has been How to Double the Service Life of Gearboxes with Precision Lubrication.